Well, I want to say welcome everyone to this third in our new seminar series that's directed to methodologies and also to postgraduates and to senior undergraduates. And I see that there's quite a number from all these different um, categories of student who are here. So that's wonderful. I'm so very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Sibabatso Manwedi. Dr. Manwedi is a research associate in our department, but obviously much more impressively, her work and calling is as a public benefits strategist. And she is currently senior executive director of the Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equality based at Columbia University in New York. So she in fact splits her time between South Africa and the USA, at least during normal conditions. Now, as concerns our seminar today, Dr. Monwedi holds a PhD in history, African history from Oxford University. And her research uses a variety of methods, both archival and oral interviews with liberation veterans in the Sudan, which is obviously a really compelling kind of and varied research. I also want to say that from the perspective of history students and postgraduates, that I think that Dr. Manwedi's career path is actually quite inspirational because um, it shows, it's a, it's a testimony to how training in history need not be applied merely in the academy, but rather like for the work she does, her passion is championing the collaborative ever, efforts of funders of government, of the private sector, and of civil society in projects of justice and public advocacy. So today she will be speaking about the challenges and rewards of research for her book, um, so Sudan's Southern Problem, Race, Rhetoric, and International Relations, 1961 to 1991. And some of you will remember that she presented that research a couple years ago. So this is gonna be a very interesting um, aspect of, of actually doing that research. So I'm gonna turn my video off and turn it over to you, Dr. Monwedi. Thank you so much, Tembisa, for inviting me um, and for having me with you um, today and for that very generous introduction. I am excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all about my research and work um, focused on um, uh, Sudan's southern problems, as, as Tembisa has mentioned. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation here, Tembisa. Would you be able to pull it up or should I be pulling it up on my end? Um, I want to just make sure that I'm in tune. I think pull it up from your end if you can. Okay. Okay. Um, let me know if this is large enough. I'm going to try split my screen into two. Um, is this large enough? That's great. That's great. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, the, the title of the talk today is of Armies and Archives, uh, Methods and Memories of Field Work with the Sudan People's Liberation Army Veterans. Um, Tamisa had asked me to begin the conversation today with a little introduction um, uh, to myself, a little bit about why I chose to study Sudan to begin with. And um, particularly as somebody coming from South Africa, and um, why would Sudan interest me as such? I often get this question. So maybe I should just uh, take, a, uh, um, take us back a few years ago, just over a decade ago, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, um, I found myself gravitating towards Black Studies. I was at Amherst College in, in a small town in Massachusetts. And um, Black Studies just felt like such a breath of fresh air. It helped theorize what I felt had been my lived experience in South Africa up until that point. Um, but at the same time, I was also gravitating towards the history of the modern Middle East. And uh, I was particularly interested in the, in the intersection between um, Africa and the Middle East. 
And um, so I decided to go and study abroad in Egypt for um, six months in my third year, only to find that although Egypt is the geographical um, point of intersection, the literal point of intersection between the Middle East and Africa, that, um, that, that, that sense of being a nexus didn't quite map out onto people's identities in the same ways. And I, I discovered in Egypt the struggles for racial equity within Sudan, um, in part because I was often mistaken for being Sudanese in Egypt. Again, that's a reference point for um, people of my complexion in, in that part of the world. But also Egypt had been home to hundreds of thousands of refugees from, from um, Sudan. Who were finding, um, who were who seeking refuge and respite from the war in, in the country. So when I returned to the United States, I, I, um, I developed an, an interest in, in the racial histories of the Sahara, uh, the Mediterranean, as well as the Indian Ocean. I felt that um, although I really adored um, my major in Black Studies, often the Black experience was understood through um, the fulcrum of the Atlantic Ocean and, and, and other histories of other racial encounters outside of white supremacy weren't explored as much. And so this, this got me interested in both Mauritania and Sudan that have very similar dynamics. Um, of course, for an undergraduate dissertation of about 30,000 words, I um, uh, it, that's actually two countries is too much to, to look at in that way. And so I had to pare it down a little bit and decided to focus on Sudan. Um, this was, of course, fortuitous because at, at around 2010, when, when I was um, a final year student in, in undergrad, I um, uh, that that coincided with the referendum in South Sudan, where Sudanese people from the South were deciding about whether or not to remain part of a united Sudan or if they were going to um, secede. And so I connected with many um, Sudanese people, Southern Sudanese people in the diaspora, particularly in the United States, um, who were all preparing for uh, the referendum vote and conscientizing their communities. It was just an incredibly charged political moment. Um, and of course, as we all know, a year later, uh, a new Sudan, South Sudan was born. So um, throughout uh, my, my academic career, I focused on different aspects of Sudan and S Sudanese history. So my, in my undergraduate uh, um, research, I, I looked at um, um, I, I, a 200 year um, view of the conflicts that were happening in Sudan uh, through the underexplored prism of race. Um, up until that point, most analyses focused on religion and, and ethnicity as the key fault lines in the country. And so I was just wanting to understand through this um, long period what the racialization processes in Sudan have been up until that point. For my masters, I uh, focused on uh, um, an all-girls school in Khartoum, Sudan, and how it managed multiculturalism in the height of empire um, in the 1920s to the 1960s. And it really served as a microcosm for the complexities of managing race, religion, and gender um, in, in a complex moment, particularly because most of the, the, the students at the school were coming from all sorts of backgrounds um, and, and not just the, the binaries of the North and South. They were coming from Armenia, from uh, Abyssinia at that point, among other places. And so it, it was a curious example of a melting pot. Again, I was trying to understand the space of identities within, um, within an aspect of, of Sudan. So in my most recent research in, in my PhD, which led to a, uh, my book, I um, focused on the post-colonial period of 1961 to 1991, in which I was exploring the competing narratives of successive uh, Sudanese governments and rebel organizations around race and racism in Sudan to international audiences. So this is really an exploration of international relations and with, with the race being at the, at the center of it um, and the evasion of it. And, and so that, that was the focus here. And, and that led to, um, to, to the book that uh, Tembisa uh, mentioned. And in, you know, just in short, the book argued that 
A critical part of understanding the civil wars in Southern Sudan between the period I mentioned, 1961 to 1991, requires understanding how they were projected and imagined abroad, how these wars were imagined and projected abroad. And I was building on John Peel's argument that narrative empowers. So this book really focused on narrative making as a site of political contestation. And it's taken the discourses of Southern Sudanese rebels very seriously. It showed that Sudanese governments um, engaged with Southern rebels on dipl as diplomatic rivals and um, in part due to, to how influential those discourses were abroad. And it explored how these competing narratives interacted abroad in divergent bids to attain international legitimacy. So these discourses had consequence abroad and they contributed to informing diplomatic action. And uh, re rebel discourse in particular shaped the political subjectivities of ordinary Southern Sudanese refugees and rebels and exile. And we'll focus on the latter today. Um, so in general, um, the, the, a mixture of archival and oral history methods made my reconstruction of the, the history of Sudan's narrative battle possible. I conducted extensive archival research in 12 archives across the world. These included the Sudan Archives in Durham, United Kingdom, the Bill Bryson Library in Durham, the um, Camboni Archives in Rome, Italy, um, the Sudan National Library Archive in Khartoum, the Institute of African and Asian Studies at the University of Khartoum, the National Archives and Library of Ethiopia, the Ministry of Defense Archives in Ethiopia, the French Center for Ethiopian Studies Newspaper Archives, the African National Congress, uh, Liberation Archives in Alice, South Africa, the anti-apartheid movement archives and the Bodleian Library archive, both at the University of Oxford in, in the United Kingdom, as well as the personal collections of Douglas H. Johnson, who's of course a leading scholar in Sudan. Moreover, I conducted uh, 21 in-depth interviews with former SPLA soldiers, Sudan People's Liberation Army, for short, um, in Ethiopia, Uganda, and the United Kingdom, as well as members of the host community in a region of Ethiopia called Gambela, where um, the SPLA camp was, as well as Sudanese diplomats, former Sudanese diplomats in Khartoum, Sudan. So through this diverse array of sources, I was able to chart the shifts in the narrative and diplomatic strategies of rebels in the state over three critical decades. Through archival research, I found a rich corpus of documentary sources that have illuminated rebel and government discursive and diplomatic interactions. Given the centrality of the Southern actors as diplomatic threats to the Sudanese government, the, the book really um, gives voice to these political actors, particularly as they remain marginal in studies of Sudanese international history. My work does not, however, provide a heroic account of either of these protagonists. Instead, I've read along and against the archival grain, drawing on Anne Stoller. Um, when dealing with the propaganda material and other documentary uh, uh, material pertaining to both actors. So press releases, newspapers, and other official publications of both Sudanese, um, Southern Sudanese rebels in exile and the Sudanese state served as an important set of resources for me. As the most important external backer to the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army, that of course the SPLA comes into, into play in 1983. Prior to that, there were different types of um, liberation movements that took center stage. But I just wanna zero in on the SPLA for, for several reasons, including the fact that their members were still alive. Um, the, the other movements didn't have as many um, surviving members from, from previous eras. And um, the SPLA's military, as well as its um, discursive contributions to the struggle were um, exceptional in ways that um, its predecessors were not. So its most um, important external backer in the period of 1983 to 1991, Ethiopia served as an appropriate site, a case through which the study, um, for me to study the movement's host relations in the 1980s. 
So I spent about just over three months in Ethiopia researching the nature of the relationship between the SPLA and Ethiopia and how the Sudanese, uh, South Sudanese combatants were received by the host society. I stayed with MSF, Doctors Without Borders, in a refugee camp on the border of South Sudan and Ethiopia, where I visited one of the main SPLA camps in a place called Itang, as well as the neighboring town of Gambela, uh, to interview key community members and local authorities about the host community's perceptions of the SPLA guerrillas during the period in question. I want to just zero in on a specific focus, um, a chapter that explores the relationship of um, between the SPLA and Ethiopia, and it also relies heavily on oral testimonies to ascertain the SPLA's exile histories from below. My understanding is that this group today is most interested in, in oral histories and its problematics. So um, it, it, in that particular chapter, I was really seeking to challenge the view that the SPLA rank and file soldiers were devoid of ideas and that the new unionist vision that was central to the SPLA's ideology, this ideology was called the New Sudan Vision, and I'll share more about that momentarily. Um, there was a view that this new unionist vision was merely the province of the elite. And so drawing on the historiographical turn away from elite perspectives and a high level uh, politics to the view of ordinary people um, about ordinary life, this particular chapter really engaged with the accounts of foot soldiers and the mid-level commanders in the SPLA. So I conducted um, life history interviews with them in Ethiopia, Uganda, and the UK. I also included accounts from a handful of citizens from Gambela who lived through the 1980s and their testimonies helped to provide context for the SPLA's soldiers' um, testimonies uh, alongside, of course, a growing body of work dedicated to the experiences of Gambela locals. But today we're just going to focus on the soldiers. Um, before we delve into that, just a word on interviews. So oral histories expose distortions. And they fill the voids and silences in national archives. This is why it's really complementary to work with both archives and, and, and oral histories. So African historians uh, or historians of Africa first conceived of oral history as an opportunity to give voice to the people normally excluded from the record and, and official um, narratives. So my work, I built on these approaches and used them to determine the extent to which the SPLA's official narrative reflected the lived reality of ordinary soldiers. Drawing on John Peel's argument um, that, I quote, narratives as lived are shaped by narratives as told, I used oral histories to gain insight into the lived experience of SPLA exiles to understand how official narratives were transmitted to soldiers and to uncover the extent to which soldiers adopted them. And I shared Peel's position that, I quote, our living and our telling of narratives are deeply and continuously implicated with one another fundamental to the reciprocal or rather the reciprocity of these relations, the shaping of life by persuasive and authoritative narratives and the narrative uh, representation of life, close quote. The soldiers' stories reveal how they lived the, the movement's ideas. Their testimonies um, uh, augment uh, what we know about the SPLA from the copious amounts of literary sources it produced, as well as the image preserved in the archive. So um, soldiers accounts, however, uh, don't establish the truth about the SPLA in exile. They do um, really illustrate the memories of a handful of soldiers who were exiled in Ethiopia during this period. So I, I engaged with these accounts critically um, but not for the purposes of locating the discrepancies between their accounts and those of objective sources. I use the data as an entry point into the self-imagination of the soldiers as members of what I consider an ideationally rich movement. 
in this way, this um, chapter and perhaps this conversation today aligns itself with the postmodern turn in oral history that looks beyond merely determining the reliability and the usability of sources. These accounts were valuable precisely because they're subjective and reveal how soldiers, how fighters made meaning of their struggle. Um, as Jocelyn Alexander's uh, apropos turn a phrase, ethnographic works of memory, oral history represents an effective method through which to investigate the shape of organizational culture and power relations. So these memories offer insight into psychosocial experiences and political subjectivities of guerrilla fighters, as well as revealing some of their complex motivations for joining and remaining in the armed struggle. So the personal narratives I collected were intertwined in the recent fratricide within the SPLA, as you know, um, the renewed civil war of 2013 in South Sudan occurred along the patterns reminiscent of the past. Riek Mashar um, led a breakaway faction that caused a major, a major schism within the SPLA in 1991 and again in 2013. And he um, was only reconciled to the movement a decade later in 2002 when he signed an agreement that gave him charge over troops that belonged to his ethnic group. The 1991 split led to a largely ethnically based civil war in South Sudan in the early 90s, largely between the newer supporters of Riek Mashar and the Dinka supporters of John Garang. So the cyclical nature of the conflict was evident uh, to, the, to, the, to the soldiers I spoke with, many of whom had lived through both iterations. I worried that the present historical moment would affect the memories that they were willing to share with me. So to mitigate against this, I thought to obtain a diverse sample of ex guerrillas and ensure that I interviewed veterans and members of the SPLA whose allegiances differed from one another in the political moment of the interview. So some of my interviews had recently been imprisoned by the current leadership of the SPLA, while others represented the, currently, uh, the current leadership as ministers of government and diplomats, and others still were living in exile in East Africa or Europe. But they were willing to speak to me about the 1980s since it was a period that was among the less charged uh, ones in SPLA history. So overall, um, the present did worm its way into the narratives about the past in unexpected ways, but the soldiers had sophisticated ways of making sense of the past and distinguishing the past from present politics. Ultimately, this complexity, I think, served uh, to strengthen uh, the, the work because it, it provides insight into both uh, the past and the present. And finally, just a quick word to note that in order to protect the identities of my informants, again, because of the sensitivities involved with talking about the SPLA in the middle of a war, I used pseudonyms for them. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, I'll just pause there to, to say that was sort of the context I wanted to provide about Self is, you know, my own relationship with Sudan and, and the, the intellectual journey I've been on, and then to share a bit about my approach to oral histories and how I believe they, they can really reveal um, a great deal precisely through their subjectivity. I just want to shift gears slightly and um, give us an insight, give us a window into what these interviews like, were like. And I, I want you to hear the voices of the soldiers themselves and to get a sense of how I wove them together. And so in my interviews, I, I sought to obtain soldiers' narratives about five different topics. I, I first wanted to know um, how they were recruited. I wanted to understand the shape of their training. I, I also wanted to understand the impact of the movement's ideas on them and how they embodied those ideas. And finally, I wanted to know what they think about the SPLA all of these years later particularly after the 1980s. And as I share their narratives, you'll understand my specific focus on 1983 to 1991 and what that period represented. So let's begin with the recruitment within the SPLA. 
Um, previously, just a soldier in his words, Gabriel, who is now an Episcopal priest and a father of five, remembers being recruited by SPLA soldiers who were deployed to his hometown. The soldiers first met with the community elders to obtain permission to enlist fighters, after which the elders directed the SPLA um, soldiers to cattle camps where young men and adolescents spent their days. There, soldiers directly addressed the youth, encouraging them to join the SPLA. Afterwards, Gabriel and his friends thought a trip to Ethiopia could be worthwhile in order to, I quote, to have a gun and not actually fight in the North, close quote. Chuckling, as he often did throughout our interview, Gabriel stated that his friends joined the SPLA for a variety of reasons, but all seemed to be based on a measure of ignorance regarding the stakes of war. And here, here's a quote from Gabriel in which he, he recalls the SPLA soldier who advertised the movement as follows. Um, he said, now, Dr. John Garang, he got people who are going to support him to give him a gun. And if you go, you'll get it. Um, you, they are ready. You will come back with it and you will carry it. He chuckled again. Uh, we don't know what we will do with a gun. Gabriel poignantly recalled knowing little about weapons, war, and politics at the tender age of 16. This is the story of his recruitment. Not uh, dissimilarly, um, Wall, um, who had picked up his studies again in a British university in 2014 after the war broke out in 1983. Had, um, the, the, the war's outbreak in 83 had halted his education. Um, he joined the SPLA because of peer pressure, in his view. Reflecting on his recruitment, he felt in retrospect, I quote, as a young person at that age, at that time, I was about 19 years. Um, sometimes you rarely calculate the risk that you undertake. It was confusing, to be honest. We didn't understand some of the things because initially, when we left our schools, uh, we didn't have a clear idea of what we were going to go through. And the assumption, the assumption was irrational. The assumption was that we were gonna go there, spend one or two months, then the whole issue will definitely be resolved. Then you come back and continue your studies. Of course, he would only pick them up um, decades later. These testimonies illuminate how the recruitment process benefited from the inexperience of youth. Jonathan, uh, another one of my interviewees, who was only 16 years old when he left South Sudan in 1987 to join the SPLA, he said that um, he had, I quote, no other options as he became part of the mass exodus of lost boys, many of whom joined the movement. So regardless of their various life stages, others were professionals, others were uh, young men like the ones I've, I've mentioned now, all of my interviewees uh, described the camp as a place of enlightenment. The interviewees all articulated a similar dialectical schema of which political, <clears throat> of their political journey into the SPLA. It comprised of a false or a limited consciousness at the point of recruitment, followed by an ideological transformation in the camp. They all remained in the SPLA in part uh, because the political vision presented in the camp resonated with them, among other reasons. <clears throat> this led to my interest in the political training they received in the camp. Stories uh, that um, soldiers typically tell about their transitions and, and their time in exile typically include the narrative trope of personal transformation. In her homespun collection of ex-guerrillas um, in uh, the Malayan War against the British, uh, Agnes Ku relays accounts of 16 women who initially joined the struggle because of the promise of education and access to a better livelihood 
and um, but, but who credit the experience of exile for having enlightened them by introducing them to, to communism and its notions of a shared brotherhood of humanity. Um, not unlike Agnes Ku's work, um, Jocelyn Alexander and Joanne McGregor's work also shows how Zipra guerrilla narratives describe the liberation war as a transformative experience uh, for the struggle uh, for freedom in Zimbabwe. So by tracing the um, recruitment processes, uh, border and river crossings, Alexander and McGregor in their work illustrate that guerrilla fighters often attribute their transformations to their experiences of transitional moments. So likewise, my own interviewees described their personal transformations as intellectual illumination that came through exposure to the movement's ideas. Here, I just want to show the significance of the SPLA's political training on the lives of these soldiers. So by joining the SPLA, the young men joined a, an explicitly political organization. Uh, the political socialization took place through a formal political training. And these, these um, I've just reconstructed these, um, <clears throat> the summary from uh, their various accounts. Um, so the training course would span about six months running concurrently with military training. So political training and military training ran side by side. Professors from the University of Addis Ababa, as well as Southern Sudanese intellectuals conducted training of the troops in English, as well as the Southern Sudanese Creole, which is called Juba Arabic. In an ideal context, new recruits would undergo a two month long basic training program. After this, the leadership would choose candidates to attend a 12 week officers training program. After the three months, the non-commissioned officers and support weapons gunners would receive more special training. Thereafter, they would return to the general uh, training for general training for another four uh, weeks um, with um, others in their unit for a training session. I just want to note here that you have to understand that in the 1980s, about half a million South Sudanese people were living in Ethiopia on the border, the vast majority of whom were SPLA soldiers. So this was um, this was a concentrated place. All the training took place in one area. And so some of these processes could be actually systematized quite um, in, 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 a, in a way that with some ease. So after these processes, the commander in chief, John Garang, occasionally would give lectures to trainees on the history of um, injustices enacted by the central government on the south, as well as other peripheral regions in the north. And he explained the reasons for the war. He continuously drew their attention to the SPLA manifesto as the movement's creed. On Sundays, the troops received more general political training uh, and education, particularly through a lecture uh, that an SPLA political commissar would give, beginning by reading messages from the chairman if he wasn't able to be there in person that were addressed to all units, the commissar would also read updates about upcoming missions, as well as the ongoing battles on different fronts in order to give the soldiers a sense of what their colleagues were doing. Um, it, the, the New Sudan vision uh, really uh, challenged the vast majority of Southerners who joined the movement, regardless of their background. This vision was unique in its history, uh, it, rather in the history of rebellion against the Sudanese government. This new Sudan vision um, did not hold that the freedom of South Sudan uh, could be found in secession. Instead, it framed all Sudanese people as needing liberation from the elites in the center of Sudan who oppressed them all. Uh, so the vision of liberation was distinctly unionist as opposed to those um, um, to, 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 to its separatist uh, predecessors. Now a, a retired commander, one of my interviewees, Simon, uh, observed that the vision required soldiers of middle class origin to perform what he called a, a special role. Uh, he said that he would hold political discussions every Thursday evening with soldiers under his command. And Simon noted, I quote, the people from the villages came with different motives. Uh, and when we were staying with them, we were telling them the reality, close quote. 
And he said, as a result of his efforts to enlighten his comrades, um, I quote, the local people, they managed to also understand, close quotes. Simon achieved this in part by using the arts. He encouraged his soldiers to sing, I quote, revolutionary songs. Some of them played a guitar traditionally used in Arabic music called the Rababa, and while others danced. Other times he used music to, I uh, quote, recreate the morale of the soldiers, close quote, after losing comrades in battle as a way of forgetting about the past, quote unquote. So, so that was a little bit about the shape of political training in, in the camp. Um, I want to just draw our attention now uh, to, the, to the impact of the SPLA ideas on the soldiers themselves. Simon recounted how John Garang explained the vision to him and his peers. He says, the concept of the new Sudan was not our idea. When we came as students, we were separatists. We were coming for the liberation of the South. So the first thing that we touched when meeting Dr. Garang, he told us that, it, um, that there is no need to fight for a smaller place. Let us fight for a bigger place. They, uh, that why should we run away from people who are really mistreating us? Why, should, why don't we also work to come to power, to have one Sudan? Then we also use the constitution against them. Since they're the, we're the, uh, they're the majority, um, the southerners were about a third of the population at the time. Since they're the majority, we, uh, so we use the constitution to also show them that we are also people that we can rule them, that the country belongs to all of us. So we embraced that one, close quote. Um, Wall shared a similar, um, a, a shared a similar <laughs> narrative. His was quite colorful of his best friend um, striking encounter with Arabs in the SPLA ranks. Um, uh, he, and he captures a similar sentiment. You'll remember Southerners um, had at that stage been, uh, the, the previous liberation movements from the South had been um, antagonistic to all Arab people and all Northerners. And so the SPLA was doing something new here. So Wall says about his friend, he was more or less at the initial stage, a separatist, a South Sudanese separatist. So when we reached Bilfam, which is one of the SPLA camps in Gambela, we found that there were already soldiers from the north, SPLA, SPLA soldiers, northerners who already, huh, he gasped, uh, SPLA soldiers. And what happened to this man? He cried with his tears. And he told me, look, if I had known that northerners have come before him, he wouldn't have joined the movement. Wall explained that over time, I quote, this friend of mine, he also attained some of the, attended some of the political schools and he became a diehard unionist, close quote. Not unlike Wall's friend, Jonathan also explained that he personally had to overcome the suspicion of his fellow Arab comrades by realizing, I quote, that in the end, they could shout the same SPLA, they could sing the same songs, they could carry the same gun that I'm carrying, and they could also share the same command. That means they are SPLA regardless of their color until the end of their lifetime. Um, and I'll just skip ahead to the aftermath. Um, and so, you know, the SPLA's robust culture of diversity did not survive. I think all that, all the accounts we've probably all heard of regarding um, this movement would attest to this. But despite the impression exile had on the soldiers individually, the drastic changes of, um, that took place in 1991 that I alluded to earlier, which included a coup within the SPLA with Riek Machar's breakaway, as well as a change of government or rather the toppling of Mengistu in, in Ethiopia. Um, that all led to the, to the SPLA's expulsion from Ethiopia and altered the movement's political culture permanently. As a result, the SPLA's golden years, as they've been called, ended. 
In the 14 years of war that followed, the movement's political training was haphazard and in the absence of a single exile location in which they could train all their troops. And so the loss of, of an exile space for most of the army was in many ways the loss of what I consider a laboratory in which the movement's leadership could experiment with multiculturalism and conduct a robust political program for all the soldiers. Um, and so the SPLA had to reconfigure itself to survive. So I just, in light of all of these changes from 1991 uh, all the way to the end of that second civil war and through to the start of the current civil war, I was curious about how these, um, these um, soldiers made sense of all of the extraordinary changes that have taken place in this political movement. All the soldiers had clearly made extraordinary sacrifices for the SPLA and had developed an emotional connection to the organization. So I just wanna close with the words of a 55 year old George, um, who I'd asked to describe what the movement meant to him. He'd spent 30 years working in the SPLA signal unit where he was intercepting the enemy's radio messages. And he was ousted by the movement leadership in the wake of the third civil war. When I met him, he'd recently been released from the SPLA detention uh, for allegedly supporting a suspected coup attempt in uh, 2013. Um, after his recent experiences, he reflected on the meaning of the SPLA as follows. I've got a, a bit of a long quote there, but I'll, I'll, I'll close with it. He says, well, it became part of my life. I believed in it because as, as a human being, you were born once, you live once and you die once and you have a mission to accomplish. So having joined the SPLA in the early eighties, I felt that I must accomplish this mission. Although it did not end up nice for me or every family member or everyone in the South, because it um, was not an easy task, it was taxing. It was taking lives of people. That's where I lost my brother, my elder brother, the one I followed from my mother, he was killed. He was among the first martyrs who were killed in 1984. He was killed in Peabor on the 26th of June, 1984. So it was not a simple exercise, but having undertaken that responsibility as a mission, I felt, that the SPLA is the one thing I can be to achieve my dream of liberating myself and my people because I have no other option. If I don't remain in it, if I don't achieve the objectives of the SPLA, I will not be living as a human being. You remember in, in Sudan, there was this thing, second class citizen, we don't count at some point before the war. So it's useless to live. It's useless to call yourself a human being. If someone looks at you as third class, you know, you don't belong in his class or high class. It's terrible. SPLA was like blood in my veins. That's the way I felt. It was part of me and I was part of it so that I achieved uh, the dream that has convinced me because I was completely convinced that the only way out for me to be an independent person is for me to hold on to the objectives and the mission of the SPLA. In closing, the SPLA soldiers experienced camp life as exile, in exile as a space that enabled them to perform new political identities, to imbibe new histories and new futures as well as to inhabit more expansive political subjectivities. Gambela was etched onto their memories as a laboratory in which the new Sudan was practiced in everyday life. No other exilic location offered the confluence of resources, spatial, political, diplomatic, militaristic that Ethiopia offered. Thus, um, these explorations that my interviews yielded has shown that the movement's nationalistic rhetoric uh, was really embraced by the guerrillas who joined. And that the narratives that were shared externally became an internal myth that shaped the movement's organizational culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sipabatso. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, I, I'm, I know that we only have 15 minutes 
but I would really um, love to encourage, especially students as a priority to using the reaction button to raise their hand and ask a question, or you may use the chat and ask a question. Um, yeah, I, maybe just to get things going. I think that um, part of what we're so interested in in some of these presentations is just your own sense of your experience in maybe conducting these interviews. If you can say something about um, some of the challenges or um, maybe placing yourself within these interviews as a woman from Southern Africa and how did that go? Were there any uh, challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? Um, yeah, great question. I mean, I, I try to begin most explorations with, um, um, with, it, with a sense of abundance within myself. So not expecting to receive closed doors or to, to experience difficulty. I just think sometimes we can preempt um, challenges by, by um, being overprotective on the front end. And um, I mean, I, I, of course, wanted to meet soldiers in public places. Um, I met in coffee shops, um, in hotel lobbies. Um, and so just to make sure I, I was um, careful for my own safety in that way. But I, I, I expected good things and I, and I think that helped <laughs> just on, on a personal level. Um, and I found that the snowball effect was really um, uh, reliable. I um, asked one person who led me to other people and so on and so forth. And so that really, that, that was a, a great way to be able to access more and more people. Uh, networking was important, but I, I think the soldiers were keen to talk to me because they felt that I was you know, an African sister and, and South Africa looms large in the Sudanese imagination, both North and South about the kind of liberation from apartheid we're able to achieve. And so there was, sense, there was a sense of solidarity that they articulated. That's, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, I see that Prudence's hand is up. Prudence, if you'd like to unmute yourself and return on your video and ask a question. Hi everyone, and thank you for this interesting presentation. So my question is, uh, you spoke about uh, your, your informants being political subjectivity. So I would like to know how did you fit this element of subjectivity into the official narrative and situate it in context with the politics of South Sudan? Thank you. Thanks, Prudence. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's how did I put um, the, the the interview the interviews in conversation with the the, the context uh, of of Sudan, the political context in the moment? Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Thanks, Prudence. I I, I think the archival history helped a great deal. Of course, the first round of, of, of research you do is always secondary. So of course you read a lot, you read for, for a long time. <laughs> and then afterwards, um, I, I did quite a lot of archival research um, and got a sense of the competing ways uh, realities were described. And, and, and so it, it felt like a bit of a layered approach. And, it, and in fact, not only in this particular chapter, I not only spoke to soldiers who were in Gambela at the time, I spoke with Gambela citizens who remember what it felt like to have those soldiers there, um, often through very complicated ways. I think one of my interviews was in Anwak, which is the language of the region. And I had a translator from Anwak to um, um, Amharic, which is the language um, spoken in, in most of Ethiopia. And then from Amharic to English, I had two translators helping me with one person's interview in particular because the, there were some serious linguistic challenges there. But it was important for me to have a layered perspective that included uh, various vantage points besides um, the Ethiopian government in the archive, besides the, the Sudanese um, liberation movement, um, the, 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 the SPLA soldiers in exile, I, I wanted to get a sense from all, all vantage points. I see that Buhutlo has a question. Um, I don't know if you want to ask that yourself, Mickey, or, or would you like me to read that? It's in the chat. No, please read it for me, I'm okay. <laughs> 
Kutla says, I really love the presentation. I like the fact that you used archives as well as giving people platform to tell their stories. My question is, while doing these interviews and coming across people with sad stories, how did you deal with that? Didn't they affect you? And weren't you, weren't they too, for, for weren't they emotional themselves, I think? Um, like the interview who the interviewee who had lost loved ones. Oh, what a fantastic question, Kutla. I mean, I, I um it, the study of, of Sudan um, is incredibly heartbreaking. Uh, that, that is um, unavoidable. And I think that um, most researchers of the region share um, that, that weight of grief alongside the people who are kind enough to share their stories with us. So um, it, I, it's just par for the course. And I think there is a power in allowing oneself to, to feel things. I think that empathetic vantage point uh, imbues something special in, in the work itself. And I think the interviewees the, and, and, and people from uh, the country you're, you're um, engaging with feel it and, and appreciate the sense of solidarity it exemplifies. In the interviews themselves, I tried to focus, and, and the research in general, I tried to focus on, on, on questions that weren't necessarily going to draw me into the pits of, of grief in that way. And so I often I tried to, um, to, yeah, this is why the 1980s was so interesting for me. It's a, it's a high point in many ways, the golden years as they're called. And so it, it felt like a shared moment of joy between myself and the soldiers. And um, I, I tried to just hold with tenderness um, the, 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 the sad things that people shared. And um, I think our humanities is an asset and not a liability in these, in these circumstances. Yeah, you're drawing a, a kind of paradox that I think is a productive one in many ways. Um, I, I'm, I'm not seeing other hands. I see that Prudence has her hand up again. Um, Prudence, you can go ahead and I'll look for other questions as well. Okay, it's just a follow up on Bukutlo's question. So I'd like to know if you did encounter any challenges with memory and if you did, how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, what a good question. Um, challenges of memory, my own? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I try to do is, is um, just to, uh, of course, I'll have my dictaphone with me, um, but it was important for me to get a texture of the places I was in for each interview. So before it started, I would take a notepad, uh, I would take notes in my notepad just about where I was. Um, so, for example, I think it was Gabrielle who was often chuckling in our conversations and you just get a sense of like, this guy's probably, he, he's a soldier, so he's, he's done what soldiers do, uh, inflict violence in all sorts of ways. But there was an extraordinary sense of humanity and vulnerability that he shared even in just his interactions with me. And so I wanted to capture that texture and so being able to both have a recording device as well as the um, as well as uh, notes was useful for me. Um, pardon me for that. I, um, I think for the soldier's own memory, people would just share where they felt that their memories were failing them. And so I tried to put that into context. Again, for me, their subjectivity was more important than objectivity. And so it was really get, getting a sense of, of, of what, what the meaning of the experience was for them, more so than the specific details of their effect. Um, well, let me ask you a question about your current position and your current work. I'm wondering how you integrate this experience of research and of writing this book that you've published and, and your, your, your work with the Atlantic Fellows and maybe um, some of the other uh, work that you do, public outreach. Um, do you find that, that the skills of research um, have a kind of application in other aspects of, of what you're doing in your, your other jobs? 
Absolutely, Tenvisa. I think, I mean, on three, three things come to mind for me. I think the first is um, you know, the PhD focused on narrative. We are living in a time where narratives define realities across the board, especially in charged social issues, social justice issues. And so, uh, you know, I, I work in leadership development now in the racial equity space. And so, um, you know, the work that I've done with, with SPLA soldiers has, uh, and just the Southern Sudanese struggle for liberation in general, has given me an appreciation for the power of narrative in shaping reality and how in many ways narrative is a weapon of the weak. And so that um, shapes a lot of what, um, you know, how, how I understand the kind of tools that uh, current racial justice leaders can use uh, today. And I also wanna mention that um, the vision for multiculturalism that the SPLA shared is extraordinary. Um, and the kind of, um, political subjectivity and expansiveness that um, the, the vision enabled soldiers to live was quite powerful. And so again, that that's part of the world making vision of all social justice pro projects. Like how, do we, how do we, in the words of Audre Lorde, find the patterns of relating as equals across our differences? And so I, again, I draw strength from the different methods used at different points in time, uh, the strategies used, the insights from those um, experiences in order to think about crafting uh, more inclusive uh, and just societies today. And I think finally, in general, all research and especially um, long research projects like doctoral work, uh, I think they give people a sense of, um, you know, uh, skills rather, not a sense of skills that are invaluable. The world is in desperate need for people who think critically, who think deeply and who think widely. And so I, I'm, I'm a believer in the fact that um, the skills one gains from doing historical research and perhaps any research um, are, are um, applicable in, 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 in the world, uh, quite across the, uh, across the field, uh, regardless of um, um, specific focus areas. I think there's something about the how beyond the what that's quite powerful. It's just beautifully expressed. I, I, I'm so inspired by that. Um, I wonder if you would take one more question from um, a, one of our postgraduates who's just completed his MA, Lungelo, if you would like to go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Come through loud. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so um, you spoke about, uh, during your presentation, you spoke about the fact, you mentioned that you visited 12 different archives in several countries and that you, um, and then obviously you used uh, a lot of oral research as well in your in 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 in, uh, uh, in, in your research. Um, uh, you also mentioned that um, uh, your view of of of, uh, of oral history is that it tends to expose distortions and fill in the void, right? So I, 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 I was wondering if you could speak more about how the the people you were interviewing how they perhaps were represented in the in the archives perhaps the national archives versus um how you came to um view them in your interactions and how they were able to uh explain their motivations for for joining the um uh the the movement and so essentially trying to see um, how were they represented in one and how did they, how were they able to represent themselves and what are the differences between the two? I don't know if um, I expressed that correctly. No, that was fantastic. Thank you, Lungela. Um, so a couple of things. I mean, I think the, the archive in general um, tends to represent the perspectives from above of you know, big names, people with high positions. So tends to, to have a, a bit of a hierarchical approach of you from above. And so oral histories um, um, give you the opportunity to do history from below in that way. But I think the most striking um, way in which the two interacted for me is, is how it felt 
rather than a correction to a distortion in the archive, the oral interviews really felt like an augmentation. It, they gave color to what I was seeing in the archive. So I didn't see many divergences. I got context, I got the human experience, and I think that was quite powerful. I also found a play in the archive that just you know, offered such a beautiful insight into an aspect of political education um, that, that I, I, again, the men themselves may not have uh, remembered to share with me. And so I think there is a way in which both provide uh, complementary perspectives. Well, on that note, I know you have to leave. <laughs> so it's disappointing to have to end now, but thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your research and for allowing us to ask you these questions also about the personal experiences of research. So thank you, Dr. Manwedi, and um, thank you everyone for joining us. And we will um, hopefully see you again with us at some point. Take care. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.